our planet Earth. A world of mystery and imagination, science and wonder that is constantly being gazed upon and unraveled by the finest minds humanity has to offer. Welcome to the UniV podcast, the show that presents a free flowing conversation with those beings at the very center of the world of academia and research from all around the globe, with your host, Simon Holland. Welcome to the very first UNIV podcast. We're very excited to have on the show Professor John Hutchinson from the Royal Veterinary College at the University of London. John is based within the Structure and Motion Laboratory and has worked somewhat predominantly in the field of evolutionary biomechanics, particularly in large terrestrial vertebrates such as elephants, crocodiles, giraffe, and of course the mighty dinosaurs. He recently appeared on the BBC documentary Attenborough and the Giant Dinosaur with Sir David himself, discussing the locomotion of elephants and the large yet unnamed titanosaur of which the documentary investigates. It is with great enthusiasm that I welcome Professor John Hutchinson to the show. I'd like to welcome you to the show and thank you for speaking with us. Sure, yeah, no problem. Now, what attracted you to this and how did you get into it? So, yeah, so generally we're, we're looking, for, um, looking for information on the, the sequence of changes within a group. So how did size change, for example? So we're either relying on living animals and measurements of living animals or measurements of, of fossils to, to the degree that the quality of the fossil record allows it. And that allows us to, to piece together the order in which things happen through evolutionary history. And that's kind of the fundamental question we're generally after first, to the, the pattern of evolution in evolutionary biology. Uh, so that's, that's one of the general kinds of questions I'm very interested in. And that, I got excited about that, uh, I guess, first from learning about Darwin as an undergraduate. I got really excited this in Darwin as a person as well as a historical um, person of major historical influence uh, and the whole history of evolutionary thought, how he, how he plays a role in that. And then later I got interested in dinosaurs, kind of reignited my childhood interest in dinosaurs and other giant animals and married the two things together, my, my passion for evolution and my passion for giant animals. So that naturally became, well, how did large land animals evolve? It's funny you mentioned Darwin because in preparation um, to speak with you, that was the book that I picked up and I kind of tried to speed read it a little bit beforehand. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and I think what they said in the, even the, in the first few pages, they start mentioning that, um, you know, that he's building upon... A lot of people's work. It's something that um, it's like a, a sort of a rich history that have, has been pieced together bit by bit. Do you find yourself in that situation? You know, you refer to sort of the tides of history. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, any, any scientist worth their salt uh, is depending a lot on the work of, of people that came before them. That, that's kind of the whole point to, to a degree of doing science is that we want to gradually build up a reservoir of knowledge so that future scientists can build upon that. So we're adding levels uh, of, uh, I guess, uh, you could think of it metaphorically as a building, that we're adding floors on top of floors, and periodically uh, we realize some of the floors we built upon might not be as strong as we thought they were, and things need to be reconstructed, uh, but uh, the process works generally. So... For me, that's part of the fun of science is uh, is learning what people what we knew about a subject or thought we knew, and then testing to see you know is is that uh, presumed knowledge accurate, and what new knowledge can we add on top of that, and and get further toward understanding the natural world. So originally, you're an American, and um, you found your way now from the University of Wisconsin, and now you're at the University of London. Um, was that kind of history that yep. you, this is the history that London has um, with the Royal Society, which you're also involved in? Um, was that part of the attraction to moving over there, or how would you get over there? Oh yeah, it was a huge attraction. I had I had lived here. My father was a professor, and, and uh, he brought us out here on a sabbatical that he did in uh, I think it was around 1982, the, the spring and summer, roughly of 1982 or 1983. So we lived out in um, Norwich, which is kind of eastern England, 
although we came through London. And I really enjoyed living in England back then when I was, what, 11 or 12 years old. And so when this job opportunity came up in London, I thought, well, that'd be a really fun adventure to, to try living and working out there and, and uh, kind of shake things up in my career, try something different in a, in a slightly different uh, society and culture, as well as the famously uh, dynamic city of London and its immense, immense and deep scientific history. Uh, I, I found it really wonderful. Um the rich history of, of science that's here. A lot of natural history research really got started in this area. Yeah. And um, so you're also involved with the Royal Society. So, I mean, you're, you're really stepping in the footsteps, like literally in the same hallways as, you know, the Christopher Wren and, and Robert Hooke and guys like that. Do you sort of, do you feel that kind of, that history when you walk, you know, around the university and, you know, veterinary science and diagrams up on the walls and, and that kind of thing? So, so yeah. I mean, I I, I interact with the Royal Society of uh, the United Kingdom, which you know, I'm not a fellow of the Royal Society, which is kind of a one of these prestigious uh, honorary posts. But I am a uh, I do interact with with uh, fellows of the Royal Society and get some funding from that uh, from that society. But our college, the Royal Veterinary College, is completely separate from that uh, okay. that old institution, the Royal Society. They're separate royal uh, institutions completely, although a lot okay. of synergy between them. And I've, I've definitely benefited from, from that synergy that there's the Royal Society, which has, yeah, like uh, Richard Owen and, and, and Darwin and many other uh, very, very famous scientists have been part of that, and many famous scientists today are as well. Uh, including some of my collaborators, but uh, the Royal Veterinary College has been around for about as long, very roughly, give or take 100 years, as the Royal Society. So there's a, a very long history there, going back to the late 1700s. Yeah, they used um, they used to do some. Um, been around. Sorry, they used to do some really cool, you know, experiments when they're kind of figuring things out. Do you do you find yourself in that sort of insight? You know, there's a lot of attention to detail. But do you kind of, is there any experiments that you sort of wish that you could do, you know, big sort of, you know, yeah, so like what's on your bucket list, I guess, as a scientist? Well, what's on my bucket list as a scientist? Like, like are you thinking classic experiments to redo or totally new experiments that, that like, no one has done before? Oh, I guess you'd be giving away some games, trade secrets, if you get told us the new ones, but... um. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We don't want to do that. We don't want to uh, give away anything away. But um, yeah, like just um... well. So I mean, I, I can I can say some kind of bucket list things. That there are animals I'd love to work with. A lot of a lot of the animals I work with are I work with them because I love them. I think they're amazing animals, and that's one way that uh, biologists uh, choose what to work on is they work on whatever interests them, what whatever excites them. I think I'm that kind of scientist more than kind of a a model organism uh, scientist who's you know someone who works on an organism because it's the best organism to study to answer whatever they're interested in in terms of some broader question. So a lot of people study fruit flies because their genetics are really well worked out. They're a great yeah. model organism for answering questions about genetics. Uh, I, I tend to just find animals that I'm interested in and study them. So I'd be really excited to work on pangolins, so these armored oh, yeah. mammals that roam uh, parts of Asia and Africa. I've, I've always found them really cute and fascinating. They can walk on two legs <laughs> in kind of a dinosaur-like posture. So uh, I would love to study them. Uh, and they're also uh, threatened by a lot of problems these days. There, uh, There's a lot of uh, trade, illegal wildlife trade in pangolins uh, to uh, feed the hunger for their uh, skin and meat uh, in uh, especially East Asian markets. Uh, so there's some some ways potentially we could even help out in some way in, in, in uh, helping uh, bring attention to this uh, major problem that may bring these really cool animals to extinction within even our lifetimes. So pangolins major bucket list animal definitely <laughs> i'm going to borrow a line and and i'm going to butcher this but it's from bill bryson's um one of bill bryson's works and he said as good as a planet is a supporting life it is much better at exterminating it and it's estimated that 99.99 reoccurring percent of um, all species that have ever appeared on the planet no longer exist so everything so um 
that statement is a marvelous scale. How would a, a, a point like that work in, in your experience? You've seen some creatures work and some divisions of creatures, you know, fail miserably. What's the kind of separating uh, factor there? Okay, oh, that's an interesting question. So that, that kind of relates to the idea of deep time, that the Earth has an incredibly long history and, and our brains are not well suited to thinking in terms of millions or let alone billions of years. And there have been a lot of species around in those, well, you know, a little over four billion years of life's history on Earth. Uh, so it's just a part of uh, a part of ecology and evolution that species inevitably go extinct. No species lives forever. And no species ever has, uh, as far as we know. Uh, ever, uh, change is the rule, really, and extinction is, is part of that change, which makes room for other organisms to, to take the place of, uh, or, of organisms that have gone extinct, or species, rather. Um, so extinction is, is a, a natural part of, of the process of, uh, of life, but um, it also means there's a lot of diversity out there. And, uh, there's a lot of diversity right now. Uh, there's a large number, millions and millions of species alive now, but that pales in comparison to the number of species that have ever existed. So there's a lot of things we can study right now in nature that are alive. We can observe them directly and do amazing experiments and other measurements. But there, it's a really fun challenge as a scientist to try to tackle all the remaining biodiversity that's out there in terms of extinct life and try to bring them into our whole picture of biology because our understanding of biology should apply just as well to extinct animals as living animals, and extinct animals should be able to contribute to our understanding of the rules of life, so to speak, just as much or, or even more so than living animals do, given that there are more extinct animals than living ones. So I think there's a, a immense potential of, of extinct life to teach us about what is possible in life, what, what can life do or not do, because the living animals today probably aren't a good enough sample of what really is possible. In fact, well, we know that's true. They're not enough. They might tell us a lot about some of the rules of, of life, but uh, if we can harness what's out there in the fossil record, there is a vast, staggering potential to answer very broad questions and, and uh, strengthen our understanding of, of how life works. Now, um, you appeared just recently in um, David Attenborough's documentary, Attenborough and the Giant Dinosaur, um, and you kind of, you were, you were, you were the, large, the large animal specialist at that point, the locomotion specialist. Um, so, yep, that, that's, that's one of my niches, uh, definitely. Completely unrelated to that, but no, not really. Is there much advantage no. left of being big these days? I mean, we're just looking at... Uh, we've got a guy called Andrew DeRosha coming up, and he's, he works with polar bears. And it seems apparent that the biggest issues facing the bears is just how much energy they require, like, you know, the ice thinning and melting. They've got to travel further, swimming and searching for food. So it's sort of that energy balance is all out of whack. Is that something we saw with the dinosaurs and their inherent failure when times got tough? And is there any advantage left for being big anymore? One answer to that question would be that everything in – in life has trade-offs. Uh, for any advantage, there's almost always a disadvantage. So in the case of being big, there are advantages that you, by being big, you're tough, you're hard to kill, you can monopolize resources like territory or food or mates because you're, because you're big um, and less susceptible to predators and so forth. But the cost is, the disadvantage is, Big animals need a lot of food and water and so forth to stay alive, and so they're very susceptible to either dying off individually if, if they don't have enough resources or even going extinct as a species uh, because there tend not to be as many big animals as small animals, all else being equal. Bigger animals, uh, by being fewer in number, are more susceptible to extinction. And so in the case of dinosaurs, it makes a lot of sense that uh, many dinosaurs were very big at the time of the extinction of dinosaurs. Uh, and so it makes sense that big dinosaurs got wiped out. They, they would have been the most vulnerable of all species, probably. But what doesn't make sense is that there were small dinosaurs that were around at the time of the, the end Cretaceous extinction of dinosaurs. 
um, some of which were birds or very bird-like animals, uh, and we don't yet understand why did those animals not make it, whereas other things like uh, small birds, lizards, crocodiles, and so forth that were around at the same time did make it. There's a clear filter that big animals didn't make it through the end Cretaceous extinction of dinosaurs and other animals. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the big mystery is not so much why big animals got wiped out, but why some smaller animals made it and others didn't. And that would be a fascinating one to answer. Would it be to do with, um, like, food scarcity and, and you know, in, in time, like, trying to uh, expand energy to look for food or efficiency, a sort of an efficiency ratio, something like that? Well, big animals tend to be very efficient. That's a, that's a benefit, especially, of, uh, well, in, in general, in, in, you know, for being a, a big animal, you, you tend not to use as much energy or need to put as much energy in to get some energy out of your ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, they're good at conserving heat, for example. They're very well insulated. Uh, so they're efficient in that way, but they need, still need, in absolute terms, a lot of energy. They need a lot of food just to stay alive because they're so big. So um, what they gain in terms of efficiency, they may suffer from in certain environmental conditions in terms of uh, if there is a, a sudden reduction in the amount of resources available, then they're going to be in big trouble because they need a, a minimal amount of resources or else they're, they're dead. And the minimal amount they need is, is still pretty considerable compared to a small animal that can uh, survive off very little at all. So now in 2016, you look around and there's a lot of species that kind of probably wouldn't have been here if humans hadn't interacted. So, for example, since you're in London, um, if you look at a creature like the Queen's corgis, like a corgi, a dog, and, <laughs> and to the naked eye, they don't really appear to be that well put together, you know, in evolutionary terms. Um, what do you think as, you know, a scientist that studies this exact thing when you look at a creature like that, what, what are you thinking? What do, what do I think of a corgi, for <laughs> example, in an evolutionary sense? Yeah. Or... Well, small dogs, uh, uh, to, t- to take the corgi example, um, or any small dog more generally, they've been produced by artificial selection. So they've been, they've evolved through a very different pattern than wild organisms do, generally speaking. So they're weird compared to natural organisms. Uh, a corgi probably would have a hard time out in nature and <laughs> either would change very very quickly or would uh, go extinct if it, uh, if it wasn't well adapted to whatever environment it was, was in. So, yeah, I look at a, something like a corgi and I think that, that is a very weird organism and... Uh, <laughs> Maybe maybe ill suited to, to the natural world, but well suited to our world. Uh, and of course, it needs us taking care of it to uh, animals like that in in order to survive, or or else, uh, yeah, it would either change or go extinct. That's basically your two choices in evolution. If the environment is tough, you've got to change or or go extinct. There's a lot of funny stuff going on, I guess, in the modern world. I, here in Australia and Perth today, we had a 42 degree day celsius and um but people love huskies yeah. here they bring huskies down and and the husky has to get around in 42 degrees it just seems like the worst uniform to to be wearing it, yeah it's just hilarious oh yeah i'm, I'm sure it's quite hot for them uh yeah <laughs> i wouldn't want to be a husky in australia no. <laughs> um okay so i have a hard enough time myself i'm not i'm not i'm a pretty big guy myself so i go to australia or out in the heat and uh I don't cope well. I grew up in Wisconsin, which has its warm summers, but uh, goes below zero in the winter. So I'm kind of more a cold weather organism. Yeah, you need hibernation. Better suited to that. (laughs) Regular hibernation is is the key. (laughs) Exactly. Okay, so um, looking at all the species, sort of, and and where they've come from, um, have you? It sort of holds you in remarkably good stead, also to look forward, possibly. Um, Have you thought about the current species? What kind of things do you think will be happening in evolutionary terms in the future? Ooh, oh, that's really hard. Predicting the future in in evolution is, or in general, uh, (laughs) in science is, is one of the hardest things. But it's, of course, what we often aim to try to do is get better predictions of what might happen 
uh, well, all the rage these days to talk about is, of course, climate change, and uh, that's almost pretty much an inevit inevitability. And so the question lately in conservation biology and other, other fields of biology is often, well, what is going to happen? What organisms are going to make it as the climate generally warms and becomes less predictable, more chaotic over the next 50, 100 years? Uh, and generally, smaller organisms are going to do pretty well. Organisms from warmer environments are going to do pretty well, relatively speaking, on average. Uh, and things like polar bears, of course, so to take that example you mentioned earlier, they are having a hard time, and they're going to have an even worse time as uh, conditions continue. Corals, of course, very famous that uh, there's coral bleaching going on because of climate change and pollution and so forth. Although corals are pretty adaptable, so if, they're, if we take care of them enough, they, they might uh, do fine. They, they can recover, studies have shown, uh, given enough time to recover. But uh, whereas once extinction happens, of course, that's forever. There's no really turning back the clock on extinction. So um, I do worry a lot about uh, larger animals and more vulnerable species in general, either because they're being overhunted or, or uh, like large-bodied animals that there aren't many of them anyway. So yeah, like rhinoceroses, we may well see the extinction of one or more species of rhinos in our lifetime. So that would be very sad. Um, I'd love to see what I can do to, to help prevent those kind of problems. So I do work with zoos and other facilities that are trying to do our best to take care of uh, large uh, land animals because uh, they are in deep trouble in general. So that'll be one of my predictions is is that uh, there's going to be a lot of extinction, uh, and it's a matter of what we do as a, as a society and a species that will determine just how bad that's going to be. There's going to be some. There already is quite a bit of extinction that has happened in the last couple thousand or more years, especially the last couple hundred. It's a matter of uh, controlling that and, and deciding how much can we really tolerate as ethically and ecologically as a species. Uh, inevitably, the changes that happen to the natural world are going to affect us uh, in terms of how much food we have as a growing overpopulated world, uh, if we keep wiping out species, there gonna be, there's going to be less for us to, to uh, eat, uh, potentially. And food resources might become more unpredictable. There may be more wars because of that unpredictability, wars over resources like food. So these things affect us, even if we can't see that easily as individuals, uh, it, uh, a lot of ecology is very unpredictable, and uh, we may be surprised by how much what happens in the not-so-distant future affects us in potentially disastrous ways, or at least inconvenient ways, or just disturbing ways. I think the extinction of any species that's preventable is, is a very sad thing, and we should be thinking ethically about you know what are we really willing to tolerate there, given that to a certain degree, we are to blame, and we know that. Hmm. Now, you also, so uh, I guess um, as a part of your, uh, just personality, I guess, being very entertaining, that's kind of how I came across your, is in your website, uh, what's in johnsfreezer.com. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's many laughs, <laughs> to, laughs, to, laughs to be had. I try, on. I try. <laughs> Sorry, say that again? Uh, I, I said I try. I try to be entertaining and keep myself entertained, uh, but thank you. And part of your own entertainment, I can tell, is putting up gory pictures on that blog. Yep, yeah, and that's a delicate issue. Yeah. Uh, sorry, was there a further question? I don't want to interrupt you. No, I can't believe it's a delicate issue. I think it's kind of cool. You don't get to so often yeah. see the inside of a raptor or what's inside the guts of a yeah. ornithomonopid mid. <laughs> That was really my motivation is that I realized, uh, especially when I was involved with this documentary called Inside Nature's Giants uh, that was filmed, what, seven years ago, I really realized back then and was thinking about it for years afterwards that people don't really get to see what the inside of an animal looks like much, and it's really fascinating in a, in a way. It's beautiful, and it's kind of a shame that that's considered sometimes taboo. Although I think, you know, if you've got a five-year-old kid, they probably don't need to see the insides of animals to a certain degree. 
<laughs> but some people are, are interested in that kind of stuff and can see the beauty in it. And I saw an opportunity there to to serve the, those kind of interests, not in a not in a, um, a nefarious kind of way, not exploiting it in any sort of uh, I don't know pornographic or other way, but really looking at it from a scientist perspective and thinking, you know, this is really wonderful. It's amazing. Look at the the variety of things evolution can produce. We only see the outside of, of that, those varieties. What's going on inside and, and how do things work on the inside? That tells us a lot about animal life. And I have found it very fun to, to share that with people and to see how much interest there really is in that. I think there's a, a still partially untapped uh, interest out there in, in this kind of subject of anatomy. Anatomy is a field that over the last 50 years has often been called, even by other biologists, uh, a dead field that, in which there's like nothing left to learn. But I've seen in my career over the last over the last 20 years, I've really witnessed how this field has, it, if it was ever in trouble, it certainly is not in trouble right now that this field has undergone an explosion. And I want to be part of sharing that to the world, showing how new technologies and new discoveries, like in terms of the fossil record and in terms of animal behavior or other things, are, are showing us uh, just how vibrant the study of anatomy is these days and how little we know about many organisms. Like when I started studying elephants, I looked through the scientific literature on the anatomy of elephants, and I realized, oh, my God, this is terrible. We know very little about the inside of elephants and what's there, how big are different organs, where are they, what do they compare like to other animals. It was a, a surprising how little there was written on what an elephant was like on the inside. And that actually can be very important. Like if you're trying to cl treat clinical problems with an elephant and you don't know what the inside of an elephant should look like in a normal animal, how are you going to know what's abnormal and how are you going to help elephants in captivity or even in the wild, for example, from a veterinary perspective? How are you going to treat any sort of problems that they have if you don't even know if a, what looks like a problem is a problem or just normal variation? So there's a lot we can do there with anatomy, for example, and anatomy is also the foundation of a lot of other science we do, like computer modeling and biomechanics and so forth. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've definitely enjoyed uh, bringing all that work to uh, the public or whoever whoever cares and, and is willing to listen. So uh, still a pretty small niche kind of blog, but uh, <laughs> it's been exciting, even the level of interest I've gotten. It's very entertaining. I mean, you've desensitized me now. If, if it's got a stomach churning rating of under five, I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you well, really yeah, I try to mix it up a bit. I, I don't want to, if I had it at a nine or 10 all the time, I think, uh, I think <laughs> it would be an overkill. And I try to keep some variety there. So the, the, something for people that really want to think more intellectually versus just the crazy visual stuff that blows your mind yeah. a little bit uh, or, or, or even disgusts you a little bit. I try to vary the, um, the stimuli that are presented in that blog and, and keep people on their toes a little bit in terms of what what's coming ne next. Although, yeah, with the stomach churning rating, trying to warn them, warn them if there is something that might upset them coming up. I think it's cr um, criminal that people say that any field in science is a dead field because um, I still teach in schools every now and then and I'm looking at kids, you know, seven, eight years old that are hearing about dinosaurs almost for the first time and each of their mind every year that there's 30 kids' minds blown again and they would just get set on a path just sort of similar way to you did just from the interest, you know, they're getting out all the books from the library and, and reading them all night with a torch, you know, that kind of stuff. Kids are still doing that. So to say that anything is a, a dead field, um, especially something, you know, related to locomotion and um, evolution would just be, you know, absolute fallacy, I, I think, in my opinion. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, the problem is that uh, scientifically, as we gather more knowledge, inevitably every field does decrease in terms of what's left to discover. As we discover more, 
if that if those discoveries are accurate, which you know sometimes they're not, uh, and we need to test that. But as we learn more, there's le less to discover. So every field is sort of dying in a way as you discover more. But also by discovering more, you open up new questions that you may have never thought of before. So it's hard to predict when a field is is dead or not. Two fields can have resurgences, and I think anatomy has has had that. I'm sure there are other examples that I'm less familiar with. I, I'm sure there are fields that have kind of died, although I couldn't name one in science that definitely is dead or just, you know, all solved. But uh, there are things we know about nature that no longer are worth uh, exploring in deep detail. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you'd want to call that a dead subject. It's just a well-known subject. Uh, Mastered. We've mastered it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if, if we've mastered it, we can move on a bit. Uh, uh, but but doesn't mean it's not important or uh, or is truly dead. I don't know. Um, I think sometimes the the labeling of a field as dead is is maybe saying more about the person applying that label than than about the field itself. Uh, yeah. I, I think uh, like in the 1950s looking back at the at the history of what was happening with anatomy, which was at least in the 1800s and into the 1930s, 40s, maybe 50s, was one of the premier sciences and then became not. One of the conflicts that was raging was between like geneticists as DNA and, and genetic approaches became more popular. Geneticists began attacking anatomists. There was a conflict between those two fields to a certain degree, uh, and I think that was territoriality. Scientists are, are human, and uh, there's always a natural jockeying for position in the echelons of science, uh, different fields trying to say, oh, we're the most important, uh, and that field over there is not so important, so you may drag down another field while you're trying to raise yours up. And I think to a certain degree, that happens with genetics, for example, and anatomy, Maybe deservedly so. I mean, genetics was incredibly important, of course. There's no question about that. And discoveries from the 50s onwards have been just revolutionary. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't uh, any possibility of a revolution in other fields, like anatomy has, has had its own lately. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting to think about this in terms of cultures and human society and uh, how... Science uh, is very, very affected by our own human temperaments and and biases. Now, John, I want to thank you uh, first of all for being on the show. But if people would like to follow you um, and and learn more, how what's the best way? Well, I'm on Twitter at John R. Hutchinson, and I have a website at. Uh, www.rvc.ac.uk slash SML, which is a structure in motion laboratory, our biomechanics lab. Those are two ways to follow me or my blog that you mentioned, what's in John's freezer.com is another example. Uh, I've got a pretty strong general presence on social media with my team, so I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, or you can just Google John Hutchinson and you'll find various virtual incarnations of me out there. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for being our very first guest. That's a huge, uh, I guess, honor for you. For, for, I couldn't presume, no, but honor for us oh, to, to yeah, have. I didn't, I didn't know it was the first guest. That's great. It's, it's, That's it's great. A huge, thank you, Simon. It's a huge honor um, to have you on the show. So thank you very much. And um, yes, I encourage everybody out there to check out John's information. He's um, hilarious on Twitter. He's got What's in John's Freezer, um, plus a lot of links to academic papers if you like to dig a little deeper. So thank you very much, John, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks a lot. Catch you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Well, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you for listening to the UniV podcast. To follow our series, please subscribe to our channel via iTunes, Beyond Pod, or the equivalent service. And if you particularly enjoyed the show, please don't forget to rate. For further information, news, videos, and articles, head to univ.com.au.